With that, we're really happy to welcome our next speaker, Herman Verlindi, who will be talking about ER equals EPR, replica wormholes, and a new holographic conjecture. Okay. Uh, first, of course, I want to thank uh, the organizers again for uh, bringing us together in even in a virtual way. Um, and uh, uh, we obviously, again, with this forum, have been able already to have uh, very interesting discussions. Uh, and I'm hoping at least that my talk will essentially continue. So everyone is invited uh, that, that to uh, ask questions along the way. I'm hoping that this talk indeed will be a discussion. I gave a version of this talk uh, a little bit more than a week ago at Stanford today. Again, I'm hoping to clarify at least uh, that the discussion, uh, for those of you who had heard the previous talk, uh, will at least add in some extra ingredients. Uh, so let me just uh, get started. Uh, so it's actually a continuation indeed of the, of the uh, beautiful talk by, by Netta, uh, where indeed uh, we'll be asking some questions about how holography works. Uh, and of course, ER is EPR is, is part of the slogan of how holography might work. Uh, and uh, especially due to the recent insights uh, indeed with, with quantum extremal services playing a role in, in indeed explaining the, the page curve, uh, one of the ingredients that came out of this is indeed a way of computing rainy entropies that involve the replica wormholes. Uh, and that uh, story uh, of entanglement and rec replica wormholes, I think is an important one to clarify right now, because indeed entanglement, as soon as you have evaporating black holes, uh, is going to play at least a more subtle role than in the pure static situation, in particular for a two-sided black hole. Uh, so indeed, my, my talk will, will mostly be, let's see if I can uh, go to the next slide even. Yeah, there it is. Uh, and it will be about two-sided black holes. Uh, and indeed, it will be about the formula, of course, that has been motivating a lot of research in quantum gravity, the bakenstein hawking relation. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the surprising sort of things, actually, is that this relation by itself, and even if you include sort of the quantum corrections, still has a lot of mystery to it. Um, uh, of course, indeed, um, due to calculations in string theory, uh, we have convinced ourselves that this formula uh, describes the uh, microstates of a one-sided black hole in supersymmetric string theory. But it's also a formula that tells us uh, something about entanglement across an event horizon. Uh, and von Neumann entropy and entanglement are not literally the same thing. Uh, and therefore, there are basically two interpretations of what this um, formula means. And indeed, both interpretations are well tested. Um, as I mentioned, in string theory, uh, we, we know that a one-sided black hole has this amount of en entropy in certain theories. Uh, and the other formula in terms of the interpretation in terms of the entanglement is coming from the uh, interpretation of the thermal field double in particular uh, as a two-sided uh, the state of a two-sided black hole uh, with an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Uh, and that identification now goes by the name ER is EPR. But uh, again, if we start thinking about uh, black holes sort of as sort of more realistic objects that can interact with an environment, uh, this identification of the thermal field double state with a pure two-sided black hole, we have to start thinking about it a little bit more deeply. Um, and essentially, my question, the, the, the talk that I'm going to give is, is going to ask a few more questions about sort of what you may want to call the fabric of space time, uh, which indeed we think of as entanglement. But then, if black holes start to evaporate, uh, they go into a mixed state. And how do you quantify entanglement when something goes into a mixed state? And that's, that's part of the question I'm going to be asking. Uh, and indeed, uh, the thermal field double is this unique state that has zero von Neumann entropy, uh, whereas a two-sided black hole is a macroscopic object. And normally, if you see a macroscopic object, um, you would think that this thing could have a, a, a large entropy, which means that you typically have a large amount of ignorance about the microstate of that object. Um, so we can ask the question, how much entropy can a two-sided black hole contain? Um, basically, it's, it's clear that it's bounded, uh, uh, and the maximum could be twice the Beckett and Hawking entropy. Uh, the minimum could be that it's in a pure state, unlikely, but it could be in a pure state, and then the entropy would be zero. 
And indeed, the thermal field double basically puts the, the two-sided black hole in a pure state, and so it sits at the zero end. Uh, but there's another description that you could take where the, the whole system basically, if you describe it as two CFTs, if both CFTs go into a maximally mixed state because of interaction with the environment, you end up with two times the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. But I'm going to be arguing that there's actually another natural answer here, uh, which is, sits right in, in the middle between zero and two times the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, and part of the story actually has to do with the fact that um, the term, thermal field double is actually not really a unique state. Although it looks like a unique state, uh, I'll explain that there are actually many thermal field doubles. Uh, and all of those actually are equivalent. Uh, and since there are many thermal field doubles, there is a, indeed a notion of entanglement or of, of entropy that one can introduce, which I'm trying to highlight in the, in the rest of the talk. So indeed, I will, as I mentioned, I will basically say, uh, put forward a new holographic conjecture. I don't think it's been stated before that if there is a, uh, an ER bridge, uh, an Einstein-Rosen bridge, uh, it's a two-sided two black hole. And if the bridge has a cross-sectional area, A, that it can carry a macroscopic amount of quantum information. Uh, and the entropy of that quantum information is going to be bounded by the bekenstein hawking entropy. So that's, that's the, the conjecture. So, so this is not entanglement entropy, it's actually quantum information encoded in the ER bridge. And since any macroscopic object can usually decohere, it also means that if you have a, a, a region of space-time with an Einstein-Rosen bridge, it can uh, be in a mixed state, uh, and it will typically be in a mixed state with entropy, again, given by the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, uh, where A, again, is the cross-sectional area of the ER bridge. So that's the proposal, uh, and I'll just prevent some, uh, provide some evidence. And the evidence is coming from sort of two types of ideas. Uh, one is the, the idea that um, indeed bulk reconstruction uh, in a holographic theory uh, uh, involves ideas with quantum error correction where there's a code subspace and that, that code subspace is much smaller than the microscopic Hilbert space of the CFT. That's one idea that will point in this direction. And the other uh, uh, evidence is, is indeed coming from, from the story that Netta also uh, described with the, uh, with the quantum extreme level surfaces and the islands that are, taken, are forming inside of the um, black hole. Uh, and this replica wormhole uh, technology is also pointing in the same direction. So those are the two arguments that I'll present. So let me first sort of uh, point to one thing, which is going to explain uh, the point I was making a moment earlier, that the, the thermal field double state is not really a unique uh, state. Uh, so here I'm going to be talking indeed about um, uh, an ER bridge or, or, or a wormhole, which is two black holes connected indeed by this tube. Uh, and uh, again, there's going to be a horizon. That's the point here in the middle. But then uh, indeed, um, if I want to describe something um, like a two-sided um, state, like the thermal field double state, um, here in, in, I'm imagining that this uh, square region here is indeed the, uh, the CFT, uh, but the CFT indeed has two sides, the left CFT and the right CFT, and I have to com connect the time evolution on one uh, side with the one on the other side, through uh, which I can call an identification, or in the same way, if I draw this picture, uh, this right region, which I could call the right CFT, and the left region have to know about uh, the, 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 time, the connection between time variables if I go across this interface. And often what we do, at least when we define the thermal field double, uh, is we imagine that these uh, left and right region are using the same time. So indeed, at this interface, we have t left and t right be equal. Uh, and then if you view this as indeed as time slicing of the geometry here on the right, uh, if I let time go forward here and there, there's going to be a jump in time at the horizon at, uh, when we go to later times. And indeed, the space-time sections have this kink. And that kink is telling me how old the black hole is. That's the time variable t that sits here. So it seems as if the time t equals zero is something special and, and that I can actually distinguish um, 
uh, uh, these different um, geometries uh, by um, uh, probing something close to the horizon, but it's actually not true. Uh, I can do a coordinate transformation on my time variables. Basically, these two time variables are defined in different time zones, if you like, and I can uh, do a, a coordinate transformation such that the transition function is no longer sitting at the horizon, but the transition function is sitting now in this identification. So this is a useful thing to keep in mind that the time evolution of the um, um, two-sided black hole uh, is something that cannot be measured locally. It can only be measured by uh, a global observable. Um, and um, essentially a local observer, yeah, doesn't know what this variable T is. Uh, if you take two observers, servers, you can do an experiment where you let them first um, connect, uh, compare their uh, watches over here. One of them jumps in here, the other one jumps in there. They meet down here, they compare their watches, and that will measure this particular time t. So that's going to be a, a, a useful thing to keep in mind. The two-sided black hole geometry is time dependent, but the time t can only cannot be measured by a local observer, but a pair of observers can measure. So there's topology here, and, and so that's part of the intuition that I'm going to be making use of, is to some extent that this time variable is a little bit like a horn of bomb face. You can only see it if you really go around the complete loop. Uh, and this is uh, worth a lot of quantum information, as we'll see uh, later. So um, I'm going to be introducing thermal states, uh, uh, and one of them indeed is this thermal field double. It's a thermal state in the sense that if I trace over one of the two systems, then the other system will go into a thermal uh, density matrix. Uh, but indeed, uh, this thermal field double is indeed a formal way of purifying uh, a thermal density matrix. Uh, and the argument that Juan presented uh, 15, uh, 20 years ago uh, that um, identifies this thermal field double with a two-sided black hole is essentially uh, by saying, okay, well, if you do the Euclidean path integral over half a thermal circle, um, you can view that Euclidean path integral of half a th some thermal circle, indeed, as producing the square root of the thermal density matrix. And then if you make an identification between the, the brass state uh, of, the, of the square root of the thermal density matrix with the cat state uh, of, uh, of the other CFT, then you've produced basically indeed an entangled state between two CFTs. Uh, and since the boundary was half, half a circle, you can fill it up holographically by half a disk. And then the equator of the disk uh, essentially becomes the initial time slice of a two-sided black hole that you can extend. Uh, by going to a Lorentzian signature. But uh, again, uh, there's going to be uh, a comment um, that in order to do this thing, I had to make this identification between the cat state, uh, the brass state and the cat state. Uh, and indeed, um, in order to identify the square root of the, dense, of the thermal density matrix with the thermal field double, I need an anti-unitary uh, 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 operation. Uh, so indeed, the choice of an anti-unitary uh, operation, which is essentially time reversal symmetry, uh, is not unique. Uh, and therefore, the thermal field double state or the identification of the thermal field double state with this geometry is actually not unique. And there's an infinite set of thermal field double states depending on the choice of the anti-unitary. Uh, Herman, usually we pick the one that comes from the Euclidean path integral, right? Uh, no, you, you still need to choose t, your time t equals zero. You need to choose which time it is, and that choice is, arbit is arbitrary unless I actually have a way of, of comparing clocks between the left and the right region. Yeah, but if I just define it by taking the square torus and cutting it in half in the, in the boundary CFT, I think that's a unique state. I don't see a choice. Of, that picks a, you're right that that picks an anti-unitary operator, but I thought it was unique. No, it's not unique. And, and I think there's a gauge symmetry, basically. I can act with any unitary on one of the CFTs, conjugate your anti-unitary with the other unitary. But, uh, but, and, the, but I think the Euclidean path integral fixes that choice, right? Uh, like, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not. Okay. At least my, my previous explanation actually of that the, 
uh, the time evolution, for example, cannot be measured locally, uh, also indicates this. But if you wish, uh, you can pick your favorite um, um, thermal field double state, and indeed other thermal field double states will then have phase factors relative to your favorite thermal field double state. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, as I mentioned, indeed, the thermal field double state, um, if I take the trace over one of the two sides, I'll get the thermal density matrix. And here's my picture of the thermal density matrix. I take two thermal field double states by tracing over one of the two sides. Uh, I glue the two sides together. And this picture will be useful uh, later on. So these are the two geometric pictures for the thermal density matrix uh, and the thermal field double. I'm going to introduce a third uh, thermal state later on, but let me first motivate it. One comment, of course, is that I'm going to assume that uh, what I mean by the Backness and Hawking entropy is the thermal entropy of this thermal density matrix. So here, indeed, we have the time evolved uh, thermal field double states. Uh, or more abstractly, uh, it's actually going to be useful to think about uh, the time evolution simply as adding a phase factor in the, uh, in the definition of the thermal field double state. And um, so I have these. Um, phase factors that I'm attaching to them. To them. Uh, and this is basically a, a basis, if you, if you wish, or at least I can look at the linear space, sorry, spanned by those states. Uh, and those states are, if these alphas and betas are chosen sufficiently randomly, uh, they're essentially an orthonormal basis. It's an overcomplete basis. Uh, typically what happens if I sum a bunch of phase factors, uh, that sum will typically average out to zero, um, at least up to some exp exponential accuracy in the entropy, uh, and uh, except indeed if the alpha and the betas uh, are the same. Uh, so I'm just introducing these as, 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 a, as an other set of states, uh, but indeed uh, part of the whole point is that these phases alpha, e to the i alpha, cannot be measured by a, a local observer. Uh, and the only way in which you could measure these phases alpha is indeed to do this experiment that I was explaining before, where you have two observers that uh, compare their clocks, they jump in, and then you can try to measure those phases alpha. But uh, let me already give you a little bit of a warning that if, if I want to measure those phases alpha and I want to do it indeed with two observers, um, Let's actually be, be honest and think about how much information is actually contained in those e to the i alphas. There's a lot of information contained in the e to the i alphas, and I want to quantify it. And then we can later decide if this is something that's going to be measurable or not. So this is indeed where the entropy is coming from, from those phases. But uh, so I'm going to argue later that, that indeed these alphas are, are usually should be considered, considered as something that cannot be locally determined. And I can think about them indeed as a hand of Bohm phases. Uh, and there are objects uh, that people actually uh, call quantum memories where they indeed make use of a similar kind of idea where you have a, a, a something with the topology of a torus, you make something for example, like the toric coat, uh, where you try to store quantum information in the topology of your tensor network, if you like. Uh, and these alphas are indeed uh, essentially uh, non-local pieces of information that's encoded by this geometry. And to quantify how much information they contain, it's actually useful to just go to the maximally mixed or to the mixed state where I take an incoherent sum of all these generalized uh, thermal field double states. Uh, and if I take that incoherent sum over all these generalized thermal field double state, I'm going to get a particular relatively unique state because essentially if I uh, indeed take an incoherent sum again of these phase factors, these things are going to be basically uh, orthogonal. Uh, and indeed, if you compute this thing for a sufficiently complete basis of um, generalized thermal field double states, you get a state that looks like this. So what has happened is that the, uh, the entanglement between the two sides that's encoded in the thermal field double state is now defaced. It's no longer 
uh, phase coherent, um, uh, but the correlation is still there. The energies are still the same between the left and the right system, but the phase information has been averaged out. So that's the, that's, I'm going to call this thing the thermal mixed double state. Now, um, as I mentioned, um, we've been learning uh, more about um, uh, bulk reconstruction. And indeed, uh, again, here's the beautiful picture of the, of the happy code, where, where indeed, first of all, we can think about the space time as in the bulk uh, as potentially build up uh, indeed from entangled uh, pieces of um, microscopic degrees of freedom. Uh, but indeed, the reconstruction of the bulk, at least when it comes to the low energy physics of it, only relies on a, uh, on a sub subset of observables, which we can call the code subspace. And um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if I take um, the thermal field double state with these phases, uh, I can view them as unitarily connected to the standard thermal field double state, if you wish. Uh, but uh, there's going to be many, many of those um, U alphas. Uh, we'll quantify that how many, uh, how many there are a little bit later. Uh, but I claim that there are going to be many time jumps, basically. You can think about this U alphas as time evol evolution operators. They're going to be U alphas such that um, they actually will commute with all the operators in the code subspace. Let's assume that they are there. Um, indeed, these U alphas, you can think about them as time evolution operators, basically over multiples of the Poincare recurrence time uh, as seen by the observers in the code subspace. Uh, indeed, if there's a Poincare recurrence time, that will look like the unit operator from the point of view of the low energy theory. Herman, am so, I supposed to, if you think of these as time evolution, then it sounds you're, at, you're asking for the operators to commute with the Hamiltonian, but there, usually we think that uh, it's kind of hard to come up with uh, operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. Yeah, so the Hamiltonian here, uh, uh, so, so the, um, uh, the code subspace, again, it's, it's a, um, this is only true, again, when projected within the code subspace. So this equation here is not true in the microscopic theory. Uh, it's true as an expectation value in the, in the code subspace. Uh, and indeed, there were some recent papers also by, by uh, John Presco and others where they, they call these kind of operators like uh, ghost operators. So indeed, there are many operators that do commute, commute with the uh, operators in the code subspace. Uh, and part of the whole point uh, of the story is that, that if I take the Poincare recurrence time, um, which indeed uh, is sort of being identified essentially over here, if I think about these as time evolution operators, then um, the Poincare recurrence time in the um, effective QFT in the bulk goes exponentially in double exponentially in terms of the entropy of the QFT in the bulk. But the actual Poincare recurrence time of the CFT goes double exponentially in terms of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And this thing is enormously much bigger than that thing. So indeed, there are going to be many multiples of the Poincare recurrence time of the QFT, Hilbert space in the bulk, that are fitting inside of that Poincare recurrence time of the CFT. And therefore, I, I will have indeed many of these alphas that I can choose. So the basic idea is that, that the, uh, uh, from the low energy perspective, um, uh, the black hole will be in a, in a pretty uncertain state. Uh, and that uncertain state is a mixed state. Uh, um, and um, so this is my uh, proposed description of the thermal field, uh, thermal, yeah, state of, a, of an entangled, uh, of a two-sided black hole. So that's just one ar argument um, uh, that sort of points in the direction uh, of um, uh, a, a two-sided black hole being able to be in a mixed state. And I'm going to give a separate argument, uh, which is based on the uh, recent, um, uh, yeah, very interesting work about the replica wormholes and, and the island uh, formula. Maybe I should stop briefly if there are questions at this point.
Sorry, I have a question, um, Herman. Uh, why do you limit yourself to time evolution? You could do a unitary transformation on one of the two sides of the entangled state, uh, and uh, then as long as this unitary, uh, which also acts on the right side, commutes with the operator O in the code subspace, all expectation values will be the same. So why do you only consider that particular sub set of unitary transformations on yeah so so let me uh, that's a good question uh, uh, I'm I'm still assuming that that I have indeed Hamel yeah I know what about the dynamics of both of the CFTs um, and um, so if I have the Hamiltonian if I give you two CFTs uh, but I would give act with a unitary on each of them uh, and that unitary would not commute with the Hamiltonian you would be able to distinguish the two CFTs but if I give you two CFTs and I let one of them time evolve, uh, uh, at least I just uh, relabel my time, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, uh, another reason is actually that, that uh, indeed, there's, there's some information that has to be still uh, shared between the two sides because, of course, the intuition, and this is another maybe way of saying, uh, making the point that I'm trying to make here, is that. Um, ER is EPR. On the one hand, we all know part of it is true because if we have quantum field theory uh, and we are looking at the state of a quantum field theory across the horizon, uh, we need entanglement. Uh, and indeed, we need to have the, the Unruh vacuum uh, or, or, the, or the, the Riedler vacuum, or sorry, the Minkowski vacuum, and, and you write that, and then it has this entangled state where the energies on both sides have to be the same. So that's the intuition of part of ER is EPR. But the, the point of the thermal field double or, or the more stronger statement of ER is EPR would be that that entanglement would have to be microscopic. Uh, and that, that the microscopic theory needs the, the, the entangled state. Whereas the, the observer would only be requiring that the entanglement is there in the quantum field theory sector of the theory. Because the quantum field theory uh, needs to have the the quantum correlations to have continuous space time. And the quantum field theory is much smaller than the CFT, and therefore it, it could be an overstatement to require entanglement purely in the, in the, uh, uh, in the full CFT. And indeed, in the recent discussions, I should add, uh, is the, um, the evaporating uh, process of a black hole is indeed going to destroy the entanglement across the horizon, or this is going to degrade it. Uh, and, and this is going to give us a way of uh, telling us how, by how much uh, the entanglement can degrade. And so I'll be going towards the uh, replica wormhole story in a minute. Let me just still, still make one other comment briefly. So when people talk about uh, time evolution after uh, starting with the thermal field double state, one interesting quantity to look at is this spectral form factor, which was introduced by Saad. Uh, or by the Stanford groups, uh, and indeed there's this paper by Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, uh, where they also even give uh, uh, yeah, some more physical explanation of this. Um, there's these three regions, which is the slope region, the ramp region, and the plateau region, uh, and uh, they uh, quantify basically the size of this, um, uh, uh, yeah, quantity, which is essentially the defaced um, square of the thermal partition function. So indeed, we, we let the thing evolve in time. Um, and indeed, because of the defacing, this thing uh, shrinks, or at least becomes smaller in time. That's the slope. Then magically, this thing starts going up again. And then it, at some point, it reaches the plateau, plateau. And my story actually today is, is mostly about the plateau. Uh, and the plateau is actually something you can understand relatively well, because indeed, if I take basically the time averaged of this quantity, so I'm going to average over all possible times, which uh, in this expectation value here means that I'm averaging over the, all those phase factors. Uh, and it's easy to see that that average over that phase factors is, is basically equating this quantity with the square the second Rainy entropy of this quantity that I call the thermal mixed double. So this is quite easy to see because basically the same dephasing happens here. 
So what I'm going to be describing uh, in a moment is actually a, a way of explaining the value of the plateau. Uh, and I'll even argue that there's a way of doing this geometrically. Okay, I promised that I had, would describe three thermal states. I saw this thermal mixed double and it is my third thermal state. Previously, I showed you a picture for the um, thermal field double, which was the half disk. Then I showed you a picture for the thermal state, uh, which is the Pac-Man geometry that I had before. Uh, and I'm proposing here a picture for this thermal mixed double state, which is a double Pac-Man. Uh, and it, it should be a double Pac-Man because it's a, a state in two CFTs. It's a mixed state. Uh, it's not a factorized state. So uh, this is my best way of drawing a, a, a mixed state on two CFTs that's not factorized. And as you can see, there's already sort of something popping up here that you could start calling the island. And we'll see indeed a, 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 a more precise uh, reason for, for drawing this particular geometry. Uh, and it sort of, I should distinguish this state that I have uh, here. Uh, let me see if this happens. Yeah, I should distinguish indeed this uh, thermal mixed double state uh, with the factorized thermal state. So the factorized thermal state would be the completely decohered state of two CFTs, where each CFT separately is in a thermal state. That would look like this. Uh, and, and the question we should ask is that if I take a black hole and it's a two-sided black hole and I let it evolve over time and I wait for a long time, in which state does the, this two-sided black hole decohere? Does it decohere into this state? Or de does it, uh, where, where it's a factorized state? Or does it decohere into this thermal mixed double state? Now, it's always possible to set up a, an evolution of two CFTs where each CFT initially, where the two CFTs are initially entangled, but where they eventually end up in this factorized thermal state uh, by just letting them each interact with their environment and letting them both basically evaporate. The question, however, that I want to ask is whether if we do that, uh, if that, first of all, corresponds to the um, replica wormhole prescription. And second of all, uh, if that indeed would correspond to a black hole, uh, a two-sided black hole, where the two sides are still connected or not. Uh, so, Herman, I have I propose... a question here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so if you take the two CFTs and you couple them separately to an environment, what I would have guessed is that after a while, there's not any correlation of any kind left between correct. the two CFTs. You just have the tensor product of the thermal state on the left and the That's thermal correct. state this on the right. That's correct. This is what I have here. That's has correct. entropy two s. Yeah. That's correct. So, so why shouldn't that be the right picture? What I'm claiming is that uh, what that corresponds to uh, is indeed um, you may have started indeed with a state where the two black uh, where the things you may have wanted to say that the two things were connected and they formed the same classical geometry. However, if I let them both individually interact with their environment and there's no correlation between the two CFTs, very quickly what will happen is that the two, uh, that from the point of view of the bulk geometry, um, uh, that the geometry immediately splits up into two black holes. And there's no reason for why I should still call that uh, something with an ER bridge. As Neta was saying in, in, in her talk also, that when you indeed turn on interaction with the environment, there's a shock wave that comes in. Uh, and basically what happens is that as soon as you let the two CFTs interact with their environment, the two shock waves will immediately kind of separate the geometry into two halves. And I'm just describing two separate one-sided black holes. Uh, and the system that I uh, would like to discuss is indeed the system where the, where the two, black, two sides of the black hole are still talking to each other and uh, where indeed the computation of the Rainy entropies will be one uh, where there's still a connected topology between the two sides. So I want to maintain the connectedness between the two sides. And we'll see, we'll, we'll see that happening. 
Uh, just briefly as a way of uh, classifying, how am I doing with time, by the way? Uh, I started at... Yeah, you started at two, so, so you, have, you have some time left. Okay, good. So, um, uh, just as a way of, of um, uh, again, distinguishing the three states, the, as I mentioned, the kind of hierarchical, there's the term of double, which has no uh, ent uh, for Neumann entropy, there's the um, factorized state, which for which the Bonormian entropy is twice the Bekkens and Hawking entropy, and this thing is sitting in the middle. Uh, and indeed, when I'm looking at the uh, mutual information between the two sides, the thermal field double, the mutual information is twice the Bekkens and Hawking entropy, uh, because this is the formula. Um, uh, these things are e individually each the Bekkens and Hawking entropy. So, so anyway, this thing is, is sitting nicely sort of in the middle between the thermal field double and this factorized state. Okay, so let me go to the uh, discussion of the um, island um, uh, prescription and the replica wormhole way of doing computations. Uh, I don't think I'm going to say too much about this picture. This is the two-sided version of the story that Netta also explained with the quantum extremal services uh, that are uh, indicating the existence of an entanglement, a region of the entanglement wedge uh, associated with uh, the environment. And um, uh, the idea is that we're going to be asking what is the density matrix? Let me go back here. Sorry. Okay. So I did that. There you go. Uh, we're interested in the density matrix uh, of the CFT. Or alternatively, we can ask about the density matrix of the environment. Uh, and um, the question we're going to ask is, um, uh, okay, let's time evolve. Um, and I'm going to separate the system indeed in a, in a, in a region that I call the CFT uh, and a region that I call the environment. And if I trace over the environment, then I get a density matrix of the CFT. Uh, and I claim that if I think about this sort of schematically, uh, by doing a path integral, um, then, uh, then schematically that density matrix of the CFT would look like this. This is the, the cat state and the bra state, uh, cat state, bra state uh, of the, CF the left CFT and the right CFT. And then this, this gap in the middle here, which is basically that island. Uh, or conversely, I could have traced over the CFT and asked what is the density matrix of the environment? Then this is the uh, this, the bra and the cat state of the left environment, the bra and the cat state of the right environment, and then this middle thing here is that island. So this is indeed the calculation uh, that was done in, in, uh, in the recent papers, where if you now do the replica trick to this particular geometric prescription, uh, we're going to basically indeed glue together the replicas uh, according to the usual way of uh, gluing together replicas, doing the replica trick. And then uh, these, both these uh, uh, pictures actually will give, give rise to the replica wormholes. But I'm going to be focusing on the one on the right. Uh, and this picture actually is, is actually topo topologically the same as this double Pac-Man geometry that I talked about, because basically what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be talking about the CFT, and I'm, I want to know what is the property of this density matrix? What does it look like? So I claim that if I need identify this picture with the picture that I have on the previous slide, and I now I'm going to take the second Rainy entropy, say, of this particular uh, state, uh, I'm going to indeed get something that looks like the replica wormhole geometry that people are talking about. Uh, and uh, the mental gymnastics is, is relatively simple. You take this thing, you take it twice, you glue this thing to the thing here, you glue that thing here, uh, and you glue them together, you build something, and that, that thing looks like that. So basically, I've, I've decomposed uh, a replica wormhole uh, geometry into the segment that actually just describes the density matrix, whose rainy entropy is that particular wormhole. I can do the same thing, go to 
third Raney entropy or fourth Raney entropy. And here's a picture for the fourth Raney entropy. And again, you can easily see that if I divide this up into four segments that my density matrix, uh, at least geometrically, will look like this double Pacman uh, density matrix. And, um, and now I'm going to give you a calculation in the next five minutes, hopefully, um, uh, that will compute um, the Rainy entropies in JT gravity of this type of geometry. Uh, and I claim that the Rainy entropies of this, uh, these multi-trumpet geometries in JT gravity, in pure JT gravity, uh, take the following form. So basically it's just the sum over n of pn to the power k, uh, where pn are the, pro are the thermal probabilities. Um, so in other words, if I uh, write this in terms of the thermal partition sum, it's the thermal partition sum of k times the inverse temperature beta divided by uh, z beta to the power k. So I'm going to do that computation. By the way, if this is indeed the answer, uh, for the Rainy entropy obtained from the geometry, I can read off from the Rainy entropies the shape of the, uh, the eigen spectrum, eigenvalue spectrum of the density matrix. So I'll, I will have derived the form of the density matrix based on the gravity computation. So I'm going to do it in JT gravity. This action was on the slide uh, of Netta. Um, Important point is that JT gravity indeed has this constant curvature matrix. The boundary theory is the Swatchen, uh, and the Swatchen and the constant curvature metric have this SO2R symmetry. Uh, so I will be able to do the computations making use of this SO2R symmetry. Very briefly, um, what I'll be making use of as a tool is that I can look at the thermal partition function in JT gravity, but I can actually twist the thermal partition function if I want by using the SL2R symmetry by inserting uh, a twisted boundary condition with uh, a certain SL2R spin, uh, SL2R transformation. Uh, and that twist partition function, you can think about it as essentially putting a twisted boundary condition around uh, the disk. But it so happens that uh, uh, indeed when you uh, impose the topology constraint basically that this twist can sort of unwind itself just by contracting in the center of ADS2, uh, indeed uh, that uh, this twist, the partition function basically collapses uh, and, and it imposes a delta function that this g has to be equal to zero. Uh, and that indeed is, is expressed by, 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 uh, by this um, form of the, uh, the twisted partition sum. This is a technical tool for me to do the computation of the Rainy entropies. Um, for those of you familiar with the properties of characters of uh, Lie groups, uh, SL2R also has this orthogonality relation that uh, if I integrate over the group and I multiply two characters, I get a delta function on the space of representations. Um, here's a useful identity that if I take a character uh, of multiplication of two groups and I conjugate one of the two group elements with H and I integrate over H, this character factorizes in like that. So Herman, uh, you're integrating over all of the representations then? Uh, here I'm integrating over the um, the continuous series representation. So this is indeed uh, the partition sum. So if I put this chi equal to zero, then this uh, thing is the is an appropriate measure that was derived again in papers by Witten and Stanford first. Uh, but uh, that's the spectral density of JT gravity, um, uh, and this is the energy, the S squared. And I'm just integrating over the energy spectrum. So S is nothing else than just the energy spectrum, but it's labeled by uh, SL2R representations. So now what I need to do is I need to uh, compute the partition function of one of these uh, n-fold trumpet geometries. So here I draw for you the three-fold uh, trumpet geometry. I'm going to 
tell you how to compute that partition sum in JT gravity. And the way you do that is you, you cut open the geometry along these dotted lines and you map it onto uh, a hyperbolic plane. Uh, in this case, it's a, a segment or at least a subpart of the Poincare disk. And all of these lines here are geodesics. At least this is even a geodesic. And there's a group element, an SL2 group element associated with each of these uh, edges, uh, segments on the edges. Uh, and um, what's going to be required in the end is that uh, the product of the group elements, if I go all the way around, has to be equal to 1. That's this relation here. Uh, and the JT gravity functional integral is basically just an integral over the space of constant curvature metrics on this topology. Uh, and that space of constant curvature metrics is, is a volume of a moduli space, uh, which is basically integrating over all the group elements that satisfy that particular holonomy constraint. And, and with the technology that I mentioned earlier, uh, knowing about the properties of characters, uh, you can actually do that computation. Uh, I can compute this volume by integrating over those group elements here. And that integral can be done indeed. Uh, and you get this expression here. So basically what happens here is that, that the, um, um, uh, the, the functional integral over the gravity over the bulk um, uh, leads to an expression that looks like this. And if you look carefully, the characters here all have the same S label here. So what that means is that uh, the partition sum in the bulk projects the boundary states uh, to have all the same energy. And that's the correlation that indeed uh, I was uh, imposing, uh, namely that the, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, the states are not independent on each of these boundaries. So this is not a factorized density matrix. It's a density matrix where the, all the sides have the same energy. Uh, so indeed, once you uh, now extract from that the, the thermal partition sum, or at least the, 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 the partition sum of this n-fold geometry, you get uh, basically a single interpretation over, uh, a single integral over energies, uh, and you get the answer that I quoted earlier. So that's the summary of the, uh, the calculation. All right. Yes. The result you get isn't the same as uh, SSS gas, right? Correct. Um, uh, what's the tension? What's the tension? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll get to it in, a, uh, in one slide. Uh, if, can I take three more minutes? I'm good. Sure. Uh, one brief comment I should mention is that um, uh, and it, uh, I, I, I mean, in my calculation, I ignored the, um, the ground state entropy. Uh, you can include that. Uh, maybe I'll just skip this part. The, the, the ground state sector, uh, and it uh, can also be included. Uh, Zenbin's question. Um, so indeed, uh, the computation that I've done here, uh, indeed, um, I'm going to call that uh, my computation, I call it the BF computation, because basically I'm using the SL2R symmetry as a way of parameterizing the, the bulk geometry. Um, and, uh, and I've done this integral over the SL2R transformations. Uh, and, and this was the computation I just described. Uh, as you mentioned, there's also the SS calculation where, where uh, uh, there's a, a, um, a um, uh, a volume that's defined using the wall Peterson uh, volume of JT gravity. Uh, the two formulas actually look almost identical. Uh, there's one difference between our formula and the formula that uh, effectively is used in those papers, is that we, we uh, do the twist using the character of the uh, SL2R symmetry, uh, whereas their computation in the end turns out to be um, a slightly different insertion of an operator, basically where this B is the geodesic length on the other side, whereas we are uh, characterizing that using an SL2R twist. Uh, and there's a slight difference between the two definitions. 
But is uh, that just inserting different complete set of states? Like, is the answer? It's a different, different set or? of it's a, it's a different defect operator, uh, and it's a different measure on the space of moduli uh, on the moduli space. Uh, you can actually take the two computations and you can compare what happens, for example, with the double trumpet. Uh, and indeed, in the SSS calculation, uh, they've taken, uh, computed the double trumpet, and there they're finding uh, a behavior that has the ramp behavior. So their computation corresponds to the ramp of the, um, of the spectral form factor, uh, whereas our computation exactly gives the plateau. So basically, what 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 uh, our, our calculation is proposed as a as a way of a classical interpretation of the plateau value of the spectral form factor, whereas their calculation is a classical interpretation of the ramp behavior of the. Uh, uh, is your choice still dual to some other matrix model, or is there? A uh, Yes, uh, there is a matrix model that would give this. Uh, basically, what you would have to do is you would have to introduce the um, matrix model uh, associated with the, the group algebra of SL2R. Uh, uh, because it's known how to write, a, because basically what we're doing indeed is a BF uh, calculation, partition sum. Uh, and it's known that the BF. Uh, uh, theory is dual to a, a matrix model where the matrix model is defined on the group algebra of the group. So there must probably be a, be some kind of matrix model that gives this too. Uh, but again, it's it's so so indeed you can compare the two. Indeed, it's different. Uh, that calculation is very natural from the point of view of this connection with Mirshakani and the matrix model defined uh, the way they have it. Uh, our calculation seems to be directly. Uh, giving us the value for the plateau. So that's the that's the comparison. Uh, of course, uh, one needs to understand this better: uh, how the two computations compare and wh why indeed they give different uh, results. Uh, one thing I should briefly mention uh, that if you take their calculation and you look at the uh, the, Q, uh, the third Rainy entropy. Uh, it turns out that in the, in, in the SSS calculation, the third Rainy entropy would actually just factorize, and that doesn't seem to make much sense, whereas our calculation gives a more reasonable answer. But okay, that's too technical, perhaps. Let me conclude. Um, so at least, uh, I guess, one, one takeaway lesson is that at least as we've I've made just a, a proposal for, for that, that there is a bound on the entropy contained in an einstein rosen bridge. Uh, and uh, a proposal is that it's bounded by the area. Uh, I've described what a typical ER bridge might look like as a, as a mixed state. Uh, and I've given you an indication that um, it's rainy entropies um, connect or at least coincide with the answers you would obtain from a replica wormhole calculation. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Okay, we do have some time for uh, a few more questions. I have a question. Um, so it, it looked to me like one could interpret your formulas as two dimensional Yang Mills theory for gauge group SL2R. Uh, right, at least uh, you, you're correct that the computation that I described here uh, is, is uh, similar. It is, yeah, would, would like correspond identical. to the answer. Identical. This is, this is exactly what one would, one would do if you uh, use the group SL2R for two dimensional Yang Mills theory. Right. And, well, you have to restrict, you said you're only integrating over the continuous representation. Uh, that's right. So, yeah, you normally in, in two dimensional Yang Mills theory, you integrate over the unitary dual. So that that part I don't fully understand, but um, yeah, let me but make one. These comment. formulas, these formulas are identical to what happens in two-dimensional Yang Mills theory. That's correct, um, uh, and and this is why I also called it the BF theory. Um, let me make one comment about this. Um, so, um, 
I need we, we have a paper at least out uh, a bit less than a year ago with uh, Luca Jesu, Silvio Puhu, and Yifan Wang, where where indeed we we reproduce the Schwarzschild correlation functions using indeed uh, an appropriate um, uh, gauge theory. Uh, it, it's not just SL two R. It turns out to be you need to some kind of suitable central extension of SL two R. You need to take a particular limit. And indeed, in that limit, only the continuous series uh, contribute. And you can, you can, on the nose, you can connect with the correlation functions of the swatch. What's so the group then? So what's yeah. the group? The group? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you need to take that many extensions of SL2R. I mean, you could. Yeah, so there's the a central problem. extension where you, you take a semi direct product with just the, the real line. Uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, you can. Um, uh, make a, a match with with the Schwarzschild dynamics. So so there's uh, you, you can yeah we worked that out in, in quite a bit of detail and the formulas that are used in this computation are indeed uh, sort of reproduced in at least yeah they're, they're used also in our discussion in that paper. Uh, that particular formulation, I should say, uh, uh, can be used uh, on spherical topology as soon as you go to higher genus Riemann surfaces with handles, um, uh, that formulation indeed would no longer apply. But in this case, we only need to be on the, on the sphere. I have a wait, 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 wait. So you're saying that this doesn't work at, usually in, well, okay. With non-zero area, usually two-dimensional yang mills theory makes sense on every surface. If the group is compact, so you're saying it's it, but then of course you can take the area goes to zero limit, and then right. it's only a partially defined theory. It can only be defined on negative Euler character at area equals zero. Now, so you're uh, saying yeah. the other way around for this group, your your extension of SL two R. Um, yeah, so the area term here is not included because indeed we uh, it's essentially the BF theory limit. Um, Sorry, is it the e to the minus beta s squared playing the role of the area term? Yeah, no, so in, in our paper what we do is, uh, we, we, uh, indeed, so the, the area term would normally obviously be integrated over the area. The e to the this term here, the e to the beta, beta s squared is actually given by the length. So what you do is you take a BF theory. Sorry, you, by area, I'm, I'm using the analogy to ordinary two-dimensional Young Mills theory. So e to the minus beta s squared plays the role of the area. That's correct. E to the uh, minus area times the quadratic chasm. Correct. Uh, in this case, it's integrated over the boundary. So it's a contour integral. So this is a 1D integral here, instead of a 2D integral. But you're right. Uh, uh, need this, this term introduces a scale on the boundary. Uh, again, this is worked out in, in, in detail in the paper with um, uh, Pufu and Elieso and, and Wang. So I, I have a question about your uh, Rainy entropy calculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so do you have to consider other saddle points in JT gravity or only this unique one contributes? Um, so, so uh, in our case, right, so, so uh, first of all, uh, just to clarify this relationship with other calculations, um, is that we don't include the bulk matter. Uh, we only do the pure uh, JT gravity, bulk gravity. Uh, and uh, we specify the, the, the topology, uh, but um, for this particular topology, um, the bulk geometry is not unique, so it's not a single saddle point. Uh, we actually have a moduli space of classical geometry and we're integrating over the moduli space. Uh, so although I can call it sort of a saddle point, but in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a, the, the path integral itself localizes into, a, or at least reduces to a finite dimensional integral. Um, but the, uh, the computation in the end, is not just uh, picking one classical saddle point geometry, but it um, uh, involves an integral over 
uh, a parameter family of classical geometries. Uh, there's still a notion of an island, uh, meaning uh, these two points basically are bounding an island, uh, at least from the point of view of the Euclidean section. So that's the same indeed as in the story of uh, the previous sort of uh, description of uh, the island prescription for the uh, rainy entropies. But, um, uh, but the location of the, uh, the two uh, edges of the island of the quantum extremal surfaces is actually something that is parameterized by these group elements and therefore you're integrating over positions. So it's not just one single saddle point, it's actually a family of saddle points in this. So that's why it's actually, I find it hard to compare our calculation with other calculations where it's assumed that there's one particular saddle point. Yeah, yeah, sorry for the inaccurate way of posing the question, but I was, uh, I, I wanted to ask why, what's the rationale for only considering this topology and not the, not the disconnected topologies, for example? Oh, what's the rationale? So, so, so uh, okay, that's a good question. So, so the, the presumption is, the, the, the question that I'm asking actually is suppose that this is the, uh, the dominant cell point that contributes to the rainy entropies. Uh, so I'm, that's my assumption. Uh, and then I'm going to ask, okay, what is the density matrix for which this is the dominant contribution? So, so this, the fact that this is the topology is actually my input. And then the output is actually that the corresponding density matrix takes the form of this thermal mixed delta state. Uh, and, and the intuition again is pretty clear that, that this, this is not a factorized uh, uh, geometry and therefore the, the corresponding density matrix is not factorized. It's also not a pure state. It's certainly a, a mixed state that we're describing here. Uh, and again, the proposal is that the thing that gives rise to these kind of rainy entropies is indeed the state that sits in the middle between the factorized state and, uh, uh, and the thermal field level state. Uh, may, I have, may I ask a question? So, uh, uh, so comparing your work with SSS um, and the plateau seems to be a non perturbative effect uh, in SSS. So do you think is any uh, like um, just a connection around uh, uh, like for, 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 for your theory, some connection to SSS, like uh, when you go from the uh, ramp to the plateau? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So, so indeed the, the, um, um, uh, the SSS description seems to be uh, nicely connected indeed with this plateau behavior, uh, sorry, this ramp behavior we immediately get an answer that gives the plateau. Uh, and um, from the point of view of the matrix model, uh, the physics that uh, describes the transition from the ramp of the, to the plateau is actually relatively complicated. It's some non-perturbative physics. Uh, it might sort of involve seem seemingly at least other topologies. Uh, but at least the conceptual question is the following then, is that if, if indeed um, going beyond the ramp would involve um, wormholes uh, or, or basically other topologies, perhaps there's a way of resumming the other topologies into something that's still basically a classical um, uh, system. Uh, and, and basically the proposal is that this plateau region can actually be captured by a simple classical system or at least a certain classical system. And that classical system is this particular BF theory. So what could be is that the transition between indeed the two descriptions uh, indeed involves a, a resummation of the physics of the uh, uh, parameterization used by SSS in a way that can reorganize itself uh, in, in, this, in, in, this, in this other uh, geometric description. Uh, uh, but okay. indeed the transition between the two is, is probably going to be uh, pretty non-trivial from the point of view of the either, either uh, starting point. Uh, I see. I, I think, I think there's one thing, uh, one observation or comment is that uh, in your formula, it seems like uh, the, the, it's always the form of uh, sum of all the different betas, right? The dependence on beta is the sum of all the, all the betas. I think that's the basic, um, 
the fact that you're assuming that all the asymptotic boundaries uh, same same energy has the same energy, but in no, the I'm not, I'm not assuming that they, I'm deriving that they have the same energy, uh, and 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 the condition that they have the same energy is because of this integral over the uh, over this age variables. It's the integral over the age variables that that implements the fact that they have the same energy. If you if you wish, you can think about these indeed as the the time differences between the boundary of the uh, the two CFTs and integrating over the time difference projects uh, on on the same uh, uh, energies basically. So so uh, okay. So it's, yeah. It's, well, it's, I think that's basically because when you define the the deformed thermal double state, uh, it's always uh, has the same energy on on on, on both sides, right? You just change the phase, which does not change the energy. That's right. So for, in the thermal mixed double state, it's it's sort of implied that they have the same energy. But as I said, in this in this particular calculation, I'm not putting the thermal mixed double state into it. It's derived from the topology of the of the of the calculation. So doing the bulk gravity calculation projects onto the states with the same energy on each bound. Okay, but in SSS, it seems like uh, they do not have that feature. Like uh, it's a function of uh, sum of or betas, which means that uh, you know a different asymptotic boundary may have different energy. Correct. In that case, uh, they may have different energies. And as I said, there's something a little bit unusual about their um, uh, calculation. I don't think their calculation can actually be interpreted as a Rainy entropy calculation. Uh, mm. uh, uh, I think our calculation can be interpreted as an rainy entropy calculation. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, Herman. For the plateau, the the leading piece doesn't agree, right? You will get uh, uh, in the plateau. You have e to the s naught times the uh, times this whatever e to the pi squared over two beta. You will get uh, the, the pi squared over two beta. No, no. Uh, I think for the plateau we get the same thing. So the s naught piece uh, we get the same uh, value of s naught as what you guys get. But n equal to one, you just get. So I'm just talking about the, just the plateau from say f y k. You should have a leading e to the s naught. You get e to the two s naught. No, e to, just z of two beta for s naught. You get e to the two, e to the s naught, right? Uh, give me a second. Uh, for the plateau, one should have e to the s naught. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I thought. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we we uh, we can dis we should be able to discuss that. But at least this is that's simply fixed by indeed by the topology uh, of I mean, the of the space. I thought the intuition here was pretty clear, which is that um, so the state you're describing is basically a, where you start with the thermal field double and then you average over all times. Correct. Um, and so that of course should be dominated by the long time behavior from the Correct. point of view of ZZ star. And so, right. but then I think you have to agree on the plateau for Correct. ZZ star because that's just the long time average. Uh, that is correct. Uh, but the, uh, I think as I, uh, yes, I was asking about the S not dependence. It, um, it, it uh, must work out if it's done correctly because it's just the long Yeah, the thing average. that yeah. seems surprising is that since the S not basically has this factor of two in front of it, uh, it, it turns out that the corresponding density matrix is, is, is factorized on the ground state. Uh, so it, it does factorize on the ground states, but it, in terms of the thermal mixed double, indeed, it's, uh, so in terms of the uh, excited states, it's still uh, in, in this um, entangled state. Okay, Herman, we have a, we have a raised hand from uh, Henry Lin. Okay. Oh, sure. Um, just a question about whether in your version of the double trumpet, whether you can add matter without getting divergences. In SSS, they get divergences whenever they add matter. I haven't, I haven't thought about that in detail. Uh, our calculation is pretty restricted in the sense that, that we, we can only do the calculation because we're looking at pure gravity. Um, I should, by the way, add that, that the paper that, that Daniel and uh, the two Daniels had on, on JT gravity also had the same feature uh, that the two sides um, of the, in the two-sided case, uh, need to have the common SL2R symmetry. 
So that particular constraint is actually identical to the one that I talked about here, I think. But do you get most of the contribution to the double trumpet from the region where the geodesic length B is small? No, uh, I don't think so. At least we, 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 we're integrating over the full um, uh, range of geometries. I have to admit again that, that, that indeed the, the region for where B is small is probably the place where the two types of calculations are differing. Okay, uh, yeah, right. Because I guess in SSS, the reason why you get divergences when you add matters because um, the most important contributions come from small b. So, Yeah, I think that um, our calculation is probably yeah, more pushed towards the bulk and pushed away from the boundary. But uh, okay. But one would think that if you add the matter, you, it's natural to have the energies be equal already in the trumpet, right? If you add matter that, that uh, energies yeah. will be equal? Will not be equal. Sure, sure. Uh, if you add matter, then indeed you, you can have sort of more like defects in the, uh, right. in the intermediate geometry mm. that can lead to um, uh, more decoupling between the two sides. Uh, but that indeed would, would not be the purely geometric description. It would have some kind of domain wall structure in, in, in the interior. At least, that's, at least there are indeed these entangled, partially entangled states that have domain wall structures. Okay. Uh, well, let's thank, uh, thank Herman again for the mm -hmm. nice talk. Thanks, Herman. Thank you. And, um,